experiment with hybrid using a hybrid Zoom technology. It worked okay this week, so we'll find out. But uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I know this is a little unusual for our usual uh, winter lecture series, but we're giving it a shot and see how things work. So I thank everyone for being here. And I'll leave it up to Dan. Okay. Um, welcome, everybody, both here uh, at the library and also at home. I hope you can hear me, uh, whether or not you're at home or here. Uh, if not, uh, signify somehow. You, you guys here can uh, raise your hands. Uh, I don't know, maybe those at home can tell you. That yeah, I got it. We're going to. Uh, so as long as we have uh, the slides beginning, we can start in earnest. Uh, what we're going to do for the uh, next uh, four sessions is talk about the uh, story of the first people actually to get to the North Pole. And uh, that story for our purposes began with the uh, early 19th century in the attempt to try to find a way from the Atlantic into the Pacific Ocean via what came to be called the Northwest Passage. And the best way to understand that maybe is to look at a map. Uh, so we can go to the next slide and go like this. My uh, signaling capacity is limited. Uh, probably this way. This what I'm doing. Uh, so here, here's the map to keep in mind uh, for those of you here and also those of you at home. This is the Canadian Arctic uh, in which uh, all of my story today actually takes place. It's becoming increasingly important to the trade and the economy of the world, uh, unfortunately because of advancing climate change. So uh, as of 2007, uh, this entire area, all the blue water you see, was for the first time free of ice for the entire year. It's not always free of ice for the entire year, but in 2007 it was, and it's free of enough ice so that they actually have cruise ships operating in those waters, something you would never have imagined, for example, 100 years before. It's, be it's becoming popular for tourism reasons, but also for purely economic reasons. There's all sorts of minerals up there of great commercial value, like bauxite and phosphates of various sorts. Oil, uh, Northern Greenland has a very rare earth minerals that are important for cell phones. So the uh, tendency is probably going to be to exploit those minerals now that the earth is warming and those waters are much more accessible. So maybe it behooves us to think about the story of how actually uh, European mariners, at least, first came to those waters and began looking for a way through. Uh, so the story does begin here in the Canadian Arctic, and it was Europeans who were mostly concerned with the idea of a Northwest Passage, remember, because they were hoping to get from the Atlantic to the Pacific, from uh, Europe to uh, the source of great wealth in China, the China trade. Uh, but the question was, was there a way through? And that's something nobody knew, uh, certainly not in the 19th century. But of course, as we all know, people have been living there for thousands of years. Uh, these waters, those islands up there, were, were very well known to the Inuits, for example. Uh, they don't, in fact, they never ever have liked to be Eskimos. Uh, Eskimo is not their word for themselves. Inuit means the people. That's their word for themselves. Eskimo is a word, we think, from another indigenous language, and it usually means netter of shoes. And that's what Europeans sometimes call them. Uh, they certainly never uh, called themselves that. Uh, and we'll be getting back to the a really important role they played eventually in the, in the arrival at the North Pole in the early 20th century. But first, uh, just to look at the uh, map here, uh, we'll be talking about this island here, which uh, Europeans didn't know was an island in the 19th century. This is Baffin Island. Uh, you notice that Baffin Bay separates Baffin Island from Greenland. Baffin Bay is an expanse of water that will figure in our story today. And if you were to go through Baffin Bay, eventually you get up here to the north, it's came to be called Lancaster Sound, as we'll see. And that does offer uh, at least the promise of a way from the Atlantic to the Pacific through Lancaster Sound, Barrow Sound, ultimately to Melville Sound, and also maybe through these islands uh, to the south, maybe out to the Pacific that way. Those islands are some of the largest in the world. Now, Baffin Island, for example, on the right-hand part of the map as you look at it, is the fifth largest island in the world. And Victoria Island, over here, weighs in at number five, the fifth largest island in the world. Uh, none of those islands were very well known at all to Europeans in the early 19th century. So if you look at this map now, the map that we know it, uh, a map uh, as far as the islands and the waters are concerned, that was perfectly well known to the Inuits for many hundreds of years. Europeans would have known nothing about any of this in the early 19th century. Their knowledge was restricted to the coast of Baffin Island, like this, part of the coast of Greenland over here, uh, and just a little bit, as we'll see, of what came to be known as Hudson Strait to the south of Baffin Island here. But everything here was completely unknown to Europeans as of the early 19th century. By the way, before we proceed, some of you may have heard that the Inuit uh, 
uh, at least 100 words, 100 separate words for snow, uh, but that's untrue. Uh, the Inuit actually referred to snow kind of the way we do. There's snow, but we would also say gently falling snow, driving snow. We have uh, adjectives and adverbs that refer to snow and what snow does. And the Inuits are just the same, except they put all those adjectives and adverbs together into one word when they talk about what's going on with snow. We keep the words separated, and that's the only difference. Now, let's uh, continue to the next slide. Uh, if you uh, know the Canadian Arctic, and if you travel there at all, you've seen these cairns set up by the Inuits. Uh, those are called uh, Inukshuks, and they're really important for navigation and hunting, and the Inuits have been doing this for uh, many, many hundreds of years during their residence uh, uh, up in the Canadian Arctic. And the uh, Inukshuks, if you go to the next slide, are featured in the flag uh, what used to be called the Northwest Territories, now it's Nunavut in Northern Canada. And this is the beautiful Nunavut flag featuring one of these Nunavut uh, set up by the Inuits. This is considered by vexicologists to be one of the most beautiful flags in the world of uh, Nunavut. And I just wanted to show you that before we go any further. Uh, those of you who are interested in vexicology, uh, this is probably the wrong place to be because I won't mention it again. Uh, maybe I'll have another few sessions. And now we continue, uh, just to make sure all of you know that it snows a lot in Canada. There's a blank slide. Uh, <laughs> oh, now we continue. Uh, so the question now is, uh, how on earth did it come to be uh, in the early 19th century that Europeans finally got serious about the idea of finding a way through all, all those islands when all they really knew about the Canadian Arctic was part of the shore of Greenland and Baffin Island and a little bit to the south. There was certainly not much promise that they would find much of a way through because it had been tried before by Europeans. Uh, back in the 16th century, for example, this man here, Martin Frobisher, tried to find a way through under the reign of Queen Elizabeth. Uh, that, of course, would always be valuable if you could find a way from the Atlantic to the Pacific and trade with China that way. Uh, so Frobisher actually gave it a try, and he was poking about on the southern coast of Baffin Island, not knowing it was an island. He wouldn't know that for a long time. But he was poking about uh, in the area between Labrador and the Canadian mainland and Baffin Island, trying to find a way through. And he kept experiencing ice and all sorts of frustration. But if you go to the next slide, on the way, he found something that deeply interested in him. Uh, he kept coming across all these rocks with what looked like a lot of gold in the midst of them, as you can see here. And that really got him distracted. He could have tried to keep going, maybe find a way to the to southern route in the Northwest Passage, but he found so many of those rocks that he decided that the thing to do was load them on the ships and take them back to England and see maybe if that was gold, in which case that would pay for not just that voyage, but maybe hundreds of different voyages. So he took about a half a ton of these rocks, about a thousand pounds of them, back to England. And his backers were so excited, they set up a, a special furnace in Dartford in England to begin heating that ore and actually try to figure out what it was. Was it gold? And you probably know, of course, that wasn't gold, that was pyrite, uh, pretty much essentially worthless. Uh, so a thousand pounds of ore for no particular good reason have been loaded in those ships and taken back. But there's a, a bright side to the story because the ore was finally used in road building around Dartford, so they actually put it to some use. But uh, it was not the sort of thing that was going to fire anybody's imagination after that. So after finding the fool's gold, uh, Frobisher's part of our story comes to an end. And then we continue for another 40 years to the next slide. And uh, the next person to try to find a way through was much more famous, and there he is, Henry Hudson. So Hudson was able to make his way uh, south of what we now know was Baffin Island uh, in 1610, hoping to find a way, perhaps, uh, off to anywhere closer to China than where he was from the Atlantic. Uh, and what he did find, if you go to the next slide, was something pretty interesting a huge bay, which now bears his name. Uh, that's Hudson Bay there, and that is the second largest watery expanse of the world that bears the name Bay. Hudson Bay is number two. Uh, the largest bay in the world is actually the Bay of Bengal. Uh, this is number two. Now, Hudson and his crew were very excited about finding that bay. They began to explore the waters around it. It was so huge, there had to be a way through. They're very enthusiastic about it. Uh, but unfortunately, wherever they went, there was always land, and at most a small river. And by uh, the end of the year, of course, the weather was getting colder, the ice was beginning to form in greater and greater chunks, 
And eventually Hudson and his crew had to winter in Hudson's Bay, even though they had never planned to do so. So he got all the way down into James Bay here after exploring as much of it as he could, and there was no going any further. There was no choice, and they had to suffer terrible privations during that winter. And you can imagine the crew members of Hudson ships who hadn't bargained for this, spending the winter in the Canadian Arctic, seething with resentment for the entire winter, and just hoping for the spring and maybe a chance of life. They somehow, most of them survived that terrible winter. And then it got to be the spring, and the ships began to emerge from the ice, hopefully going back towards Europe. But the crew then did what they probably been planning to do for several months. They mutinied, took over the ship from Hudson, and sent Hudson, his son, and several others in a boat, cast them adrift, while the rest of them made their way back towards Europe. And Hudson and his son and the others in the ship were never heard from again. We don't know where and how they died, uh, but they certainly would have, wouldn't have survived that. So at least they knew that much there was Hudson's Bay, and the Hudson's Bay, of course, lives in the name of one of the most famous companies in the world. In fact, it is the uh, oldest North American company to this day, founded in 1670, named after Henry Hudson, Hudson Bay Company, known to all Canadians, go to the next slide, as simply the Bay. Uh, so the Bay still exists to this day, a living memorial to what Hudson had found, that the great water expanse biting in to northern Canada. So that was in the 17th century. 200 years went by, and there was no further effort that meant anything by Europeans to try to find the way through. So what had to happen before these efforts would finally be renewed? And all that changed. This lack of interest, finally, in finding a Northwest Passage after what Frobisher and Hudson had done after the Napoleonic Wars in the early 19th century. And everything changed about polar exploration and the reason the North Pole was eventually attained uh, has to do with the next figure in our story. So if you go to the next slide, uh, we find this man here. And he's the secret to everything. That is Sir John Barrow, who was the uh, second secretary of the Admiralty at the end of the Napoleonic Wars. As second secretary to the British Admiralty, Admiralty uh, Sir John Barrow had a problem. And the problem was by 1815, the Napoleonic Wars were over. And what that meant was the Royal Navy didn't have a whole lot to do now. There were 130,000 officers in the Royal Navy. Most of them simply went home and did the best they could at something else. But there were still 23,000 officers in the Royal Navy who had no particular duty to occupy them since there was no war going on and no war in the immediate future. What were they going to do? Most of them were living on half pay in some port or inland town in Great Britain, not enough to live on, suffering real privations on half pay. Uh, and those who were still on active duty weren't really occupied in doing much constructive. So it occurred to Barrow, if there's not going to be a war, there was no war in the offing at all, some way had to be found to occupy those officers. Why not unleash them in the task of exploration around the world, especially polar exploration, and maybe especially the search for the Northwest Passage, which, if they could find it, would be a real boon for British commerce. For 40 years, Barrow would be the primary apostle for British-sponsored exploration around the globe, especially in the Canadian Arctic. And it was there that he would make his lasting and enduring contribution. If anybody could do it or sponsor the expeditions that could, it was Sir John Barrow, a man of immense energy. He was brilliant. He spoke five languages, including Chinese, extremely well. He routinely wrote more than 40,000 letters a year as Second Secretary to the Admiralty, a post he held until he was in his 80s. He somehow avoided any important physical illness over the course of all those years. Uh, he finally one day uh, went to the doctor for what I guess in the 19th century was a checkup. Uh, he was 53 years old. He went to the doctor for the first time ever, he said, and that was the first time anybody ever checked his pulse. And he said that was a strange experience. So with this health and this immense ability to work hard and to eventually get his imprint in terms of the plans he was making upon the Royal Navy, the great age of polar exploration was about to begin. By the way, people grew to trust Barrow in his intelligence and energy so much that in 1815, by which point he'd be given second secretary for about 11 years, uh, they actually went to him when they had a problem. And that the problem was, where do we put Napoleon? 
Uh, he had just been captured. We'll get back to that in a minute. Uh, where was he going to go? And Sir John Barrow thought hardly at all. He said, I got just the place, St. Helena, in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. He's never going to escape from there. And that's why Napoleon went to St. Helena. Well, it occurred to Barrow that the best way to use these half paid officers who had nothing much else to do was to send the best of them off into the Canadian Arctic. Think about the national prestige that Britain would acquire if they could only find a way through the islands in the inlets uh, to the west of Baffin Island. And so for the next 30 years, that's what he was going to try to do. And that, that is where, as I said, he would really make his reputation. Sir John Barrow, second secretary to the Admiralty, the first of the great permanent posts in the British bureaucracy that would have nothing to do with the change of administrations, nothing to do with party. He would just keep that job for over 40 years uh, an outstanding public servant indeed. But who would he send in the wake of Frobisher and Hudson to try to find a way through a Northwest Passage? Uh, in 1817, as we'll see in the next slide, the choice fell upon this man here, and that is John Ross, Lieutenant John Ross of the Royal Navy, who by then, by 1817, had been continuously at sea throughout the Napoleonic Wars for the better part of 30 years. Now, he had made a great record during the war. At one point off the coast of Spain, there he was in his frigate, an officer among many, when he saw below him a Spanish gunboat attempting to cause trouble with his frigate. And it occurred to Lieutenant John Ross to attack the Spanish gunboat by jumping in and taking on the crew. So he beckoned to the crew behind him, follow me, grabbed his cutlass, jumped into the Spanish gunboat, and then looked above him, and the crew were kind of looking at him still on the ship. And there he was alone in the gunboat. Now what was he going to do? And it occurred to him that there was only one thing to do, and that is take on all 15 Spaniards all by himself, mm -hmm. uh, which is what he did. He killed four of the Spaniards. He wounded three of the others. He sent five jumping overboard. And it was only then that the other crew members decided to jump in and see if they could do anything for him. Uh, and by that time, Ross had a Spanish bayonet in him, but uh, he injured both of his legs really bad in the scrape. But he survived, uh, now a hero. And so naturally, it was John Ross who would be chosen to lead this expedition into the great Canadian Arctic. So in 1818, after a year of planning, uh, off he went uh, towards the great Arctic to try to find the Northwest Passage. Uh, he didn't know, remember, that Baffin Island was an island, but maybe the idea would be to go up the coast of what we now know to be Baffin Island, see if there was a way through to the north, and in the meantime, explore as much of the Greenland coast on the other side as he possibly could. Uh, now, he would not be alone, uh, as we'll see. Uh, he had two others with him. We'll go to the next slide. That will be important parts of our story. And one man is this guy here. We'll hear a lot from him today. That's James Clark Ross. Now, if you look at James Clark Ross here, uh, and you're probably saying to yourselves what everybody else said, he was known as the best-looking man in the Royal Navy. Uh, that's James <laughs> Clark Ross. Uh, he was only 18 years old. He was the nephew of John Ross, the commander of the expedition who we just saw. So James Clark Ross would be on the expedition. And also, the next guy on our list, next slide, this man here would also eventually become famous. Uh, that's William Perry, P-A-R-R-Y, uh, known as the 798th best-looking man in the Royal Navy. No, I just did that. <laughs> Uh, and the, the other thing about uh, this expedition, not just they had two first-class future explorers with them, James Clark Ross and, and Perry, uh, there was also an invention that would make its appearance on the world stage because of John Ross's expedition. And now we go to the next slide. And uh, the invention was known, John Ross named it because he invented it, as the deep sea clam. So that's the deep sea clam there. And the idea was to go into the Arctic and use that to hang it off the ship and come up with soil samples uh, as long as they were in shallow water and they could actually find something to bring back to the scientists. And the crew members just laughed at this, deep sea clam, what's that? But in fact, it actually worked. It could uh, pinch into the sea bottom if they were in shallow waters, get soil samples. Uh, and it was to the great delight of scientists back at the Royal Geographical Society uh, that those samples were bought by John Ross. Okay, so what was he going to do? That was 1818, cross the Atlantic, took two ships, I think they would be uh, Isabella and the Alexander, uh, with him to try to find the Northwest Passage. we we'll go to the next slide. And what he was going to do, remember, was go uh, up Baffin Bay, especially along the coast of Greenland, 
and eventually tried to turn at some point left and see if there was a way through. So they knew about Lancaster Sound, but they didn't know if that was a way through. William Baffin, all the way back in the 17th century, had identified that piece of water, but did it go through or not? That's what they didn't know. Uh, so off they went uh, in 1818, and he began to uh, sneak up the Greenland coast like that. That part of the coast was reasonably well known to whalers, but the farther up the coast he went, the less likely it would be the whalers would ever get that north. And he eventually got to parts of the coast way up here where whalers had never gone. And he began to confront and meet Inuits who had never met Europeans before. And there was one thing about those Inuits that astonished John Ross when he got up to the northern part of Greenland, finally. And that is that when he looked at their harpoons, the harpoons were actually made of iron. And nobody on that expedition could believe it. What were Inuits doing who had never had contact with Europeans with iron? Uh, iron was not something that was manufactured by indigenous peoples. The smelting process that Europeans had was not available to them. So how on earth did they get iron? And John Ross asked about that. And it turned out that about 10,000 years ago, a meteorite, in fact, a great number of them, had fallen in northern Greenland and placed themselves upon the ground. And for 800 years, Inuits had been going to that great series of meteorites and using them as iron deposits. And that's why they had iron harpoons. And John Ross and the others really wanted to see where those meteorites were. Uh, and the way they were described, it sounded really fascinating. 50 tons of meteorites, I think it's still the largest meteorite deposit ever recorded in human history, and it was right up there in northern Greenland. Uh, but they never got to where the deposit was because that wasn't their job. They're supposed to go west to see if they can get through to the Pacific, but not supposed to go poking around for meteorites. And so he was never able to find it. But for 70 years, other Europeans wanted to find where those iron deposits were, and they were never able to do it until our own Peary, who would eventually be credited with getting to the North Pole, decided enough was enough, and he wanted to get to where those iron deposits were, and he found an Inuit who had taken him there, and he was the one who finally found the great meteorites. And what he decided to do was build a railway so he could get to the meteorites and take them back to New York. And he told the Inuits, don't worry, I'll bring them back to you. We're just taking them there temporarily. Uh, of course, he was lying. He stole almost all of the meteorites. And if you go to the next slide, uh, you can still see them to this day, many of them, at the Museum of Natural History. Uh, Mrs. Peary sold the meteorites for the modern equivalent of over a million dollars to the Museum of Natural History, and they're on display to this day. Well, at any rate, uh, John Ross would know nothing of that. Uh, his job was trying to get to the west. So eventually, after exploring a lot of the Greenland coast, uh, he turned to the west to try to find if he could get to Lancaster Sound. By this time, he was 76 degrees north, which was uh, as far north as any European had ever gone. To the west he went, and then he turned to what we now know to be Lancaster Sound, which is between Baffin Island and Devon Island. For 30 miles, he tripped through the sound, the first Europeans ever to get that far. And then he could see in front of him what looked like mountains. And that profoundly discouraged him because if those were mountains, that meant that the sound was really an inlet. And that whatever Baffin Island was, it kept going. And the only thing to do was turn around. Now, according to his account, Perry was furious at this. He was convinced those weren't mountains booming in the distance. He was convinced that was just an effect of the fog in the ice, that they weren't mountains at all, and that whatever this was could be a way through. And he later said that he protested the decision to turn back, but John Ross would not listen. He named the mountains on August 31st, uh, 1818, the Kroger Mountains. And once he named them, he turned back, gave the orders to do so. But in fact, we know those weren't mountains. It was just an effect of fog. That actually, that straight did go through. But back he went, armed now with the so-called knowledge that those were mountains, having named them, got back to England, and nobody was more upset about this than John Barrow. Barrow, sitting at his desk in the Admiralty, who never climbed anything taller maybe than uh, a hill in Regent Park, was 
absolutely astonished that a Royal Navy officer would turn back just because he thought he saw mountains. And very unfairly, he insisted that Magellan would have kept going, Columbus would have kept going, Captain Cook would have kept going. They never would have turned back. A voyage, he said, in the, uh, in, in the back and sea that was nothing more, he said, than a nice summer excursion. Well, nothing could be more mistaken. That was very unfair. But he was absolutely sure, as was Perry, that probably Lancaster Sound was indeed a sound and that the thing to do was try again. And so naturally, in 1819, they would try again. Uh, and this time, Perry would command the expedition and they would take two ships back to Lancaster Sound and see if they could get through that way. So the next slide, uh, I think we'll show you the ships. Uh, they're the Hecla on the left and the Griper on the right. The Hecla was a very interesting ship. It's a, it's a bomb ship, technically. And what that meant was the only use for the ship was to serve as a platform for bombarding the shore, very popular during the Napoleonic Wars. And the idea was these ships had to be very, very strong indeed, maybe perfectly suitable for Arctic exploration, maybe very good against the ice because they had to be so strong. The idea was uh, they had to endure the recoil from a very heavy mortar, fiery heavy shell in shore bombardment. So if they could endure the recoil, then they could recoil, they could endure almost anything. And so that's why the Hecla was chosen. All of these bomb ships were named after famous volcanoes. And the Hecla uh, was named after a volcano in Iceland. And its sister ship, the Griper, joined it. On off they went in 1819, hoping maybe to find a way through and actually prepared this time to spend the winter in the Arctic if they really had to. Along with him, again, was James Clark Ross. Well, Perry wasted no time. He made it to Lancaster Sound, which he really did think was a sound, on July 31st, a month before John Ross had gotten there uh, the previous year in 1818. And this time there was no doubt. Through the sound he went, no sign of any actual mountains. To his delight, he found that he could keep going. With great excitement, staying clear of whatever ice was on either side of the ship, they kept going through Lancaster Sound, uh, now and then encountering schools of whales. If you go to the next slide, uh, they also would see these creatures, uh, great squads of narwhals, uh, very mysterious to Europeans, but in great plenty in Lancaster Sound. Now, it was August, turning into September. They kept going. They turned into a little inlet. Maybe we can go back to the map and we can suggest where it is. I think just a few slides before. Yeah. As it's important to see the geography as Perry made what he thought might be a successful Northwest Passage excursion. So what they did was they're going this way to Lancaster Sound. Uh, Devon Island, they identified as land to the, to the right, to the north. There's Baffin Island, which they were now suspecting was an island. And on they went, they went through, they got to this part here, that's Prince Regent Inlet. Temporarily, he turned in there to the south but seeing no good way maybe to proceed that way, very luckily he turned back. And now he was in what came to be called Barrow Strait, and he just kept going as the season advanced in August turned to September, delighted in the progress he was making. He got to 110 degrees longitude, which is a really good idea for him. He was now that far west, and that meant that he won a thousand pound admiralty prize for actually getting to 110 degrees longitude. But he kept going as the season advanced, and he went all the way through what we now know to be Melville Sound, and he decided to poke around this island up here, not knowing it was an island, but suspecting it was. And maybe that wasn't the best idea, because now it was the second week in September, and once he got up to Melville Island, that's when the ice really set in. And now we'll go to the next slide after those narwhals, which may be the first time in Bedford, anybody has said the next slide after Narwhals. <laughs> now we go to the next slide. And this is kind of what it looked like. The ice was now besetting the Griper and the Hecla on the southern side of Melville Island. And there was no way up. They would indeed have to pass the winter there. And it's worth pausing to maybe come to grips with their predicament. There was absolutely no hope of rescue. Nobody had any idea where they were. They were way off the European maps by this point, uh, where no European had ever gone or come close to. It was up to them. They were now left to their own devices. And it was here that Perry came into his own 
as one of the great commanders in the history of polar exploration, because he was the one who really showed the way that all future expeditions would take advantage of, of living a year in the Arctic wastes. Everybody knew that by November, uh, the sun was going to disappear for the last time, and they wouldn't see it until February. Everybody knew there would be utter darkness, beset by ice. How do you survive an entire year, perhaps, under those conditions? There are three things you've got to do, and Perry showed the way. Uh, number one, uh, and you would probably think of this yourself, everybody's got to keep busy. There were dozens of crew members, and they were all told, as the ships were now locked in the ice, that whatever your routine was at sea, you're going to keep it now. If your watch was four hours at two in the afternoon, you keep the same watch, even though we're beset by ice. Despite the danger of frostbite, you're going to leave the ships for exercise. You're going to wander around, even if it just means walking and nothing else. But above all, you keep busy every single day, no matter whether the ship needed or not. They took the great holy stones and they knelt down and they cleaned the deck with the stones the way they always did in the Royal Navy. They were called holy stones because they had to bend down to do it like this, as if you're praying. Uh, it didn't matter, but didn't seem like much use to it. It was all a matter of keeping busy. Uh, now, sometimes when they were walking around on the mandatory exercise excursions in the ice, their hands would get very cold. There were problems with frostbite. And in fact, one crew member had frostbite so bad that when he got off the ice, went to see the ship's surgeon, he put the hands of this guy in water to try to begin to defrost them. And the hands were supposedly so cold that it made the water around it freeze. That's how bad these conditions could be. But if you would keep busy and be inspected for cleanliness now and then, maybe that was one ingredient in a successful wintering in the Arctic. Number two, rule number two, don't just keep the men busy, keep them amused. They actually published a newspaper, the very first newspaper published in the Arctic. It was called the North Georgia Gazette in Winter Chronicle, talking about what the men were doing, what the men were thinking, sharing articles on all manner of subjects. They published a paper, and they also put on amateur theatricals. The star of those theatricals uh, would often play a woman's role, and that was James Clark Ross, because he was the best looking man in the Royal Navy. Uh, and almost every week, there was a theatrical, there was a play. The men would keep busy that way, not just at work, but also in amusements. And if they didn't know how to read, somebody would now teach them how to read. And that could not have been easy, because they had to read by candlelight, obviously, December, January, February, in the March, it could have been a bad strain of the eyes, but everybody who couldn't read learned to read on those ships, the Hecla and the Griper. That was rule number two, keep them happy and amused, not just busy. And rule number three, the most important rule of all, is make sure they're eating the right kind of food. And luckily they packed the right kind of food with them before they left England. Uh, they had uh, all sorts of canned vegetables. They had salt and meat. Uh, uh, both of those things are good to, to, to ward off a scurvy. And for things that they couldn't bring with them, they went out and hunted. And that winter, they actually were able to eat 3,766 pounds of musk oxen and caribou, uh, which were likely unusually plentiful that weekend. So with all that food, nobody died of starvation. Nobody died of scurvy. There was only one death the entire expedition. Somebody died of a pre-existing pulmonary condition. Uh, but that was it. Remarkably successful. And it showed that the Arctic was perfectly livable if you knew what you were doing. <laughs> then it got to be August, and they're still on the ice. It's June, July, August. Almost a full year they spent in that ice. Only in August did the ice break up a little bit, and they were able to go. So if you go to the next slide, this is uh, a little bit about what their predicament looked like uh, in the southern part of Melville Island. Uh, here are the men uh, exercising on the ice. They're trying to kind of channel through. Uh, as the ice in August it began to be perhaps in a condition where they could begin to do that. Uh, but notice all of them keeping busy fishing or whatever they had to do, hunting, they're, they're shooting at birds over there. And one way or another, uh, they were able to live through the winter. Uh, so they got through the ice finally in August. And uh, Perry thought about turning to the right and maybe seeing if they could keep going because they were pretty far west. But the ice was too thick. It was late August, early September. Nobody wanted to spend another winter wasn't enough food for that. And so the thing to do was turn back after one of the most successful polar, uh, polar exploration expeditions of all time. Before we leave Perry, if you go to the next slide, uh, probably a lot of you will recognize the name P-A-R-R-Y uh, because a lot of things are named after Perry in Canada, including Perry Sound, 
Uh, that's lovely Perry Sound right there. I think in Ontario. And who was born in Perry Sound? Very good. Go to the next slide. Yeah. Known by all New Englanders, uh, the man from Perry Sound, Bobby Orr. Uh, and uh, we owe the name of his town to uh, Perry, of course. Now, another thing that he came up with, if you go to the next slide, which would be really important, was the perfect food for the Arctic. And there it is. Uh, almost all ensuing expeditions would take some of this. Uh, and that's pemmican, well known to the Plains Indians, including uh, the Lakota and the Cree. And it's just uh, shredded dried beef or other kinds of meat in little berries mixed in. Very nutritious. It keeps a long time. It's light. You can pack a lot of this. And Perry figured that was the perfect food, and uh, almost nobody would disagree with him. Pemmican was so good, if you didn't know where your next food supply was going to come from, that many years later during the Boer War in the late 19th century, British soldiers would take pemmican with them in little tins just in case their real rations ran out and they had nothing to live on in the uh, middle of South Africa. That's how reliable it was. Uh, and if you developed a taste for it, uh, it was not bad at all. Now, the more they went through the Canadian Arctic and those islands in the 1820s, John Ross would try again uh, in another expedition, for example. James Clark Ross would go back. Uh, the more it occurred to them that maybe while they were at it, maybe they should try to find a way to the North Pole. And it's only here that Barrow and the explorers by the 1820s began to think of that as a goal someday. Why not make it not just to the Pacific, but also to the North Pole? And the very first attempt to do that was led by Perry with James Clark Ross in 1827. If you go to the next slide, uh, they decided to try to get to the pole from Spitsbergen, a great island to the north of Norway, named Spitsbergen by the Dutch because Spitsbergen means jagged mountains, which Spitsbergen has. They got up there, and from there, they decided to try to get to the North Pole. And that was one of the most difficult of all polar attempts here in the late 1820s. What they found was what they strongly suspected, and that is that the North Pole, uh, wherever it is, uh, is not on solid land. It's actually on sea ice. And what that means is the sea ice moves. And what these poor guys were doing was trying to get north on the ice at the very same time that the ice was going south. So they figured they went 580 nautical miles from the uh, verge of the ice up to where they, up to the North Pole, but they didn't get 580 nautical miles, they only went 292 miles in real terms because the ice itself was moving against them to the south. In one heartbreaking day, they thought they were gonna go five miles, uh, they didn't get anywhere near that. They kept trying and they kept trying, and it took them five days to go one mile because the ice kept going the wrong direction. And to make matters worse, if it rained a lot, which it did that winter, 1827, 1828, what that meant was the ice would form these little jagged edges, which would hurt them badly if they scraped up against them. They called them pen knives. Just the first example of all the impediments and obstructions, which would mean that the North Pole would not be attained at any point in the 19th century. To make that, to make things even worse, the sun was very bright uh, for a long time because by now it's the summer, of course, when they're trying to do it. Uh, snow blindness afflicted them. Uh, but even with that, they got to 82 degrees north, uh, eight degrees shy of 90, where the North Pole is. The farthest north any human being would go until, uh, I think eight, the 1870, so that record stood for 50 years, the farthest north, 82 degrees. But a much bigger achievement awaited James Clark Ross. We go to uh, the next slide. Uh, this is William Gilbert, who was Queen Elizabeth's physician in the 16th century. And it was William Gilbert who theorized that the Earth was what we know it is, actually a gigantic magnet. He theorized that the Earth had an iron core, which accounts for the magnetic properties of the Earth itself. And if the Earth has a, magnet, a magnetary quality, the Earth is in fact a magnet, as he said, what that had to mean was the Earth had a north and south magnetic polar structure, north magnetic pole and south magnetic pole, because all magnets are two poles, north and south. And if the Earth is a magnet, it must be that way too. So if you go to the next slide, uh, what Europeans, and especially the British, now wanted to do was actually find the North Magnetic Pole. That is the point to the north 
where all the magnetic field, field lines are going straight up or straight down. There's only one point like it, and that's the North Magnetic Pole. And if you could find that, that would be a great use to navigation because compasses don't point literally to the North Pole, they point to the North Magnetic Pole. Well, where was it? And James Clark Ross wanted to find it. So off he went, trying to find where this might be. And finally, after a great deal of effort, on August 1st, 1831, the great day came. We go to the next slide. He got to a point, and here's the moment, kind of fancifully, this was discovered, where he could hang uh, a, a, a little line with a iron, I guess, iron on the, the bottom of it, where a needle would point exactly straight down with no variation at all. Is this a needle on this dip line, which is what he called it, was pointing straight down at this point on what we now know to be the Boothia Peninsula. Then that meant that he had arrived at the North Magnetic Pole. In fact, he measured the angle of 89 degrees of 59 minutes, close enough to 90. And in fact, that meant he felt that he had done it. Confusingly enough, of course, the North Magnetic Pole, which is what we call it, is really the South Magnetic Pole because all magnets remember have two poles. And if you have a compass and it's pointing north, that's the North Pole of the compass pointing north. So it can't point to north, it's got to point to south because it's the opposite pole. So even though the North Magnetic Pole is in the north, it's really the South Magnetic Pole because it has to be the opposite of what the compass is pointing to. Uh, but that aside, he had actually found it and it would be one of the great achievements of his life. James Clark Ross, if you go to the next slide, uh, wasn't even content with that. Now that he had found the North Magnetic Pole, and this could occur to you, what's the next thing that you'd want to find? The South Magnetic Pole, uh, which is not really the South Magnetic Pole, because even though it's in the South, it's really North, because it's the South part of whatever it is. <laughs> uh, but, but I was going to go to try to find that. And in, and in the 1830s, he uh, took two bomb vessels, sturdy bomb vessels built to, remember, hold up under the recoils of those heavy mortars, down to the southern part of the Atlantic. And he began to poke around the coast, and he got into what very coincidentally came to be known as the Ross Sea. And then he began to approach what we now know as Ross Island, James Clark Ross did. And in January, finally, after a long time looking for something, in January of 1841, the Hecla, just like the Hecla, the Erebus, this bomb ship, was named after a volcano. But it was the Erebus and the Terror, these two ships. And they began to see, looming in the distance, one of the great sites of polar exploration. And here it is, this mountain. And they named it after their ship, Mount Erebus. This is January 28, 1841. A great mountain, they described it, belching smoke. We now know it to be 12,000 feet high. It has many interesting features. Among the interesting features on this mountain that James Clark Ross and his crew had now sighted uh, was a feature known as Nausea Knob. And I only bring that up because if you want to buy a vacation house, uh, I wouldn't name it Nausea Knob. But there, there is something up there called Nausea Knob. Scientists love Mount Erebus, as it came to be known, because it is an active volcano, but not so active that you can't approach it. It's very active, but you can still do research on it without too much fear. And that's why it's a great scientific destination to this day. But they were awestruck at the beauty of this part of Antarctica, Mount Erebus. What they didn't know was that something even more awesome was awaiting them. So as they kept exploring that part of Antarctica, if you go to the next slide, here they are in this part here. And then a day came in 1841 when the mist began to clear a little bit as they're poking about the coast. And they saw in front of them one of the great sights any human being has ever seen. And that was a wall of ice. And we can look at it on the next slide. 500 miles long, the size of France. Nothing but ice. And that's the Ross Ice Shell, named, of course, after James Clark Ross. It was so breathtaking when they saw it that one of the crew members said uh, nobody could literally talk. They were gaping at each other, at the beauty and splendor of this. What one crew member called the most rare and magnificent sight that ever the human eye witnessed since the world was created. Absolutely magnificent. So huge that 20 years ago, a part of it broke off, became an iceberg, and that part is the largest iceberg ever recorded. 
When you think about icebergs, you're thinking about something that kind of sticks up and you can get your mind around it. This iceberg called B15 was the size of Connecticut, breaking off from that shelf. And it was beautiful, but it was also an obstruction for James Clark Ross. There's no way through it, of course. He took one look at that thing and he eventually said, we might as well go through the Great Cliffs of Dover. Nobody's getting through this. Uh, and that meant that he had to eventually turn back. But 3,000 square miles was the size of that iceberg, B15. Now, Mount Erebus, if you go back to that slide, as I said, it's still a subject of scientific study, uh, but it's also pretty dangerous because that's the scene of a, a terrible human tragedy uh, that happened 138 years after James Clark Ross and his crew first saw it. New Zealanders used to operate very consistently uh, a tourism excursion to Mount Erebus in that part of Antarctica. And you, you pay some money, you, take, you get on a plane, you fly down to Antarctica, you look around from your window, uh, usually at a low altitude, and then, then you fly back. Well, on one of those excursions, it's going to be about an 11, 11 hour flight. In one of those excursions, the computer showed a flight plan that was different than what the crew members thought the plane was going to do. So there's a fatal discrepancy between the crew's idea, the pilot's idea of the flight plan, and what the plane was actually computed to do, programmed to do. And the result of that is this jet airliner crashed right into Mount Erebus. They really should have seen it in front of them, but there was so much whiteness and glare from the sun that they literally couldn't see the mountain in front of them. That's why they depended upon the computer. And that's why they crashed. Uh, 257 people died in that crash. It's the greatest disaster in New Zealand history to this day on Mount Erebus. Uh, but there's no denying the majesty of it and no denying James Clark Ross's achievement in mapping so much of the coast of Antarctica so that he was now the most famous polar explorer in Britain. He went back to England, now a hero, just as Perry was a hero. Even John Ross, who had turned back in Lancaster Sound, uh, had made some successful expeditions after this. So all three of them were well known. All three of them had lived up to some extent to Barrow's expectations. But what had they not done? Nobody had found the passage. Nobody had gotten through. Perry had gone a long way, but even he didn't get through. And time was running out for Sir John Barrow. He was now 80 years old, still at the same post he had held for 40 years. And he wanted to send one more big expedition to try to find the passage. But who would command it? The obvious choice was Perry, but Perry told Barrow in no uncertain terms, I've been to the Arctic repeatedly, it's time for a rest, I can't go back there again. And then he went to James Clark Ross, and he offered the post to Ross, take one big expedition, we'll finally find it. Uh, and James Clark Ross had spent the better part of 20 years in the Arctic by now, either the Antarctic or the Arctic, and he had just gotten married, and he told Barrow, I don't think it's the best idea right now, because uh, I've just gotten married, she doesn't want me to go, I don't think he probably did either. So it's not going to be the Rosses, and it's not going to be Perry. Who's going to go? So James Clark Ross told Barrow, who desperately wanted to find this uh, before he had to retire. Even he was going to retire. The name finally came up from the lips of James Clark Ross of uh, the next man. Once we get past the magnetic field, uh, next, we to the Ross shell, and it's him. Uh, so that's uh, Sir John Franklin. Uh, and he would be the choice to lead this greatest of all Northwest Passage expeditions, which Barrow believed and hoped would be the summit of his service and career. Now, why would he be the choice? Well, nobody seemed to be any better than him. Uh, that's probably the best answer. But the fact was, he had a lot of absolutely admirable service behind him by the time the choice settled on Franklin as the man to lead the expedition. If you go to the next slide, uh, one thing I like about him is he accompanied, accompanied the intrepid Sir Matthew Flinders on Flinders' famous circumnavigation of Australia, the very first person to do that uh, towards the end of, of the 18th century. Uh, but what I really like about him is Flinders, this is one of many Flinders statues in Australia and the world, had a, a cat who he absolutely adored. Flinders and this cat were inseparable. Uh, and the cat is often featured in Flinders statues. This is no exception. The cat's name uh, was Trim. 
uh, after a character in Trist of Shandy, known for his loyalty. So Flinders and Trim were inseparable, uh, and I believe Trim actually made that certain navigation with Flinders, although Trim gets much less credit. But uh, so Franklin was on that ship, and then if you go to the next slide, Franklin was also um, um, one of the officers on one of the most famous vessels in the Royal Navy, and that's the HMS Bellerophon, which fought at Trafalgar. Franklin was, was a hero at the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805. But the Bellerophon's great distinction was that on July 23rd, 1815, that's where the Napoleonic Wars ended after the better part of 25 years of destruction. Because on that day, Napoleon, having been defeated at Waterloo, got on a little skiff and rowed out to the Bellerophon to surrender to Great Britain. And what he said as he surrendered was, he said just to the commander, I have come to throw myself on the protection of your prince in laws. And here we see Napoleon on the Bellerophon, uh, ultimately being taken into exile at St. Helena on Sir John Barrow's recommendation. So Franklin was there on the Bellerophon, uh, at least during the Trafalgar action. And also in 1815 and 1814, he was at the Battle of New Orleans. And his heroism at New Orleans was one of the few bright spots of that disastrous British campaign. So all of that showed that he was brave, uh, that he was resourceful. But what would he be doing in the Arctic? Well, there was a reason he would be sent to the Arctic. He'd already been there. And if you go to the next slide, uh, you'll see what he was going to do. Uh, he was responsible for mapping a great deal of what is now Nunavut in the Canadian Arctic. This is a part of the scenery that he would have marched through. What he did, if you remember the uh, great Hudson Bay expanse of water we saw earlier, he uh, embarked in Hudson Bay, and then he went hundreds and hundreds of miles, over 800 miles overland to the Saskatchewan River in 1818. And then from there, he spent two winters mapping and exploring the wilderness. And then off he went to the north along the Coppermine River. Now we can go to the next slide. This is the Coppermine. And from there, he got to the coast of Canada, what we now know would be the Arctic coast. And it was Franklin in 1819, 1820, 1821, uh, who explored this area and also mapped a great deal of the Arctic coast, 500 miles of it, to the east of the Coppermine. And that was a tremendous service indeed. But he's especially remembered for what happened next, because once they got to this point, as it was August of 1821, they mapped this coast, and they've been hoping maybe to see Perry or Ross on one of their expeditions, but that didn't happen. They had to be content with mapping the coast. But it was now time to turn back because now it's getting closer to fall, autumn. And it occurred to Franklin that the thing to do was not to go back to the copper mine. They needed to get to this camp here called Fort Enterprise. It occurred to him that the thing to do was a shortcut, go overland, and get to Fort Enterprise that way. It's not really a fort, it's really a camp. But they had to get there because there was food there and they were running out of food. They were out of Pemmican by September 1821. And as they began to take the shortcut through the wilderness, they had almost nothing to eat besides what they could catch themselves in terms of game. And if you go to the next slide, the only other thing they had were these lichens called a trip de roche that they could scrape off the rocks, which were miserably tasting, but would actually leave them with the illusion, at least, of being full. There were no trees. They called it the barren lands, as you might have seen in the map. So there wasn't wood for fire. All they had were things they could scrape off the rocks and catch themselves. And game was getting scarce as they traced through the wilderness. There was now almost nothing to eat, but what sustained them was the thought of food at Fort Enterprise. If only they could get there on the copper mine, food would be awaiting them. People have been instructed to leave food there. So finally, after terrible, terrible suffering, they got to the camp and there was nothing there. The food depot had not been left. And that's when Sir John Franklin began boiling his very boots and gnawing on the boots to at least have an illusion of sustenance. And for the rest of his life, he was known as the man who ate his boots because of what happened at Camp Enterprise. One of the crew members was killed by another member of the expedition who then resorted to cannibalism. And that man was killed by somebody else. Uh, nine of 20 of them died 
during these terrible months of despair and suffering. Franklin himself only survived because eventually uh, some of the first peoples arrived with food at Camp Enterprise, and that meant that he would live. He wrote an account of this, became very famous, and Sir John Franklin, having survived this in 1821, was the choice to go back to the Arctic. If he could survive that, he could survive anything. But if you've been following along, you now know what the problem is. Uh, that was in 1821. It is now 1844, 1845, and Sir John Franklin wasn't in his 30s anymore. He was 59. He was uh, kind of close to my age. Uh, I don't even like going to Worcester. But they're going to send him to the Canadian Arctic. They're going to send him all the way there. He's completely unsuitable for this sort of thing. If you go to the next slide, uh, this, is, this is Lady Franklin. Uh, Lady Franklin wanted him to go. And one reason was that Lady Franklin and Sir John Franklin had had a fairly unhappy experience in Tasmania where John Franklin was serving as governor in the late 1830s and into the 1840s. He was actually a very humane, good man, but sometimes humane, good men get taken advantage of. And that was true about Sir John Franklin. His reputation suffered for this because he couldn't really get his hands on the administration in Tasmania. And he wanted to do something great and worthwhile to make up for this. What he thought maybe was a failure, uh, in Tasmania, and Lady Franklin encouraged him to do so. By the way, Lady Franklin uh, herself was very rich. She was also a very cultured person. If you go to the next slide, she uh, built this beautiful Grecian temple outside of Hobart in Tasmania, and she wanted it to be an art gallery. But after they left, it was neglected. They used to store apples for many years. But I'm glad to say by the 1840s, it did become an art gallery, and it's the Lady Franklin Gallery to this day. She did a lot of wonderful things. They, they encouraged education in Tasmania. She actually embarked upon an effort to rid Tasmania of snakes. I'm not sure that was a great idea. But she, uh, she got the government to pay people a shilling for every dead snake that came in. I'm glad to say it didn't work. But at least she, according to a lot of people, had the welfare of the people of Tasmania at heart, and so did her husband, Sir John Franklin. Unfortunately, though, a lot of people didn't give him credit for that. And before we go on, I did want to mention that Sir John Franklin was such a nice guy that he refused to flog people on any royal navy ship he commanded. So that uh, usually if I, Franklin was commanding a ship, it got a new nickname, the crew members would call it HMS Paradise because Franklin was such a good and humane commander. Wanting therefore to resurrect what he thought of as a suffering reputation and encouraged by his wife, Lady Franklin, Sir John Franklin lobbied for the position of commander for this new expedition. And Sir John Barrow, in one of his last acts as second secretary to the Admiralty, agreed. It was now, as I said, 1845, and they would take James Clark Ross's ships, the Erebus and the Terror, which had proved their mettle in Antarctica, across the Atlantic, back into Baffin Bay, as we'll see in the next slide. And then, that's, a, that's Sir John Franklin uh, as he was in 1845. And now we go to the next slide. And the idea was to go back to Lancaster Sound, uh, just what Perry and others have done. Uh, continue this way through Barrow Strait. And at some point, before they got up here to where Perry had spent the winter by Melville Island, uh, they're supposed to turn south or southwest and see if they could get into the Pacific this way. So those are their instructions. They loaded up on canned goods, just as all expeditions did. They had 8,000 tins of canned goods stored on the Erebus and the Terror on the assumption that they would have to spend at least one winter and maybe more in the Arctic. But it wasn't just the tin cans. They had 7,000 pounds of tobacco. They had 32,000 pounds of salted meat, 36,000 pounds of ship's biscuit, 5,000 gallons of ale, 27 pounds of candles for the months of darkness that awaited them, and one monkey named Jacko. Uh, provided at the last minute by Lady Franklin to the crew. And with all that food, they also had another advantage. Uh, this would be the first expedition to go to the Arctic with a steam engine. It had propelled the, the Erebus and the Terror at about three miles an hour. Maybe that would help break up some ice if they ran into too much ice. They reinforced everything with iron. They were all ready to go. This would be the expedition that would finally get through. Uh, Barrow thought so. A lot of other people did too. So off they went, May of 1845. 
around Scotland to the Orkneys, took on some water, plunged across the Atlantic, turned into Baffin Bay, as all other expeditions almost had done. And on July 26th, they were sighted by whaling vessels off the coast of Greenland. And the members of the Erebus and the Terror, they gave the whaling vessels some mail to take back, exchange greetings. And that was July 26th, 1845. And 1845 ended. 1846 came and went. And nobody back in England heard anything from these guys. But there was nothing unusual about that. Perry and others had spent winters in the Arctic. That's probably what Franklin was doing. And then came 1847. Still no work. Just before he had left, Sir John Ross, the man who had famously turned back, thinking that fog was mountains in Lancaster Sound, promised Franklin, if you're not back in 1847, I'll come looking for you. And Franklin choked up a little bit, said, thank you, Sir John. You're the only one who has made such a promise. That 1847 was over. Now it's 1848. Maybe Franklin had been demanding that the Admiralty try to do something about this. Where's my husband? Where is this expedition? But the Admiralty said they've got enough food for three years. They got enough food in those vessels for three years. It's nothing to worry about. But now it's 1848. That's into the third, getting into the fourth year. And that's when they began to be worried. What has happened to them? Barrow finally had retired, aged 81. If anybody was going to send search vessels, it wasn't going to be him. It was going to be somebody else. But by the middle part of 1848, pressure was rising. Somebody's got to go looking for Franklin. Where could they be? And I'll take up that question on Sunday when I see you next. <laughs> <laughs> So, so we will end uh, on that note, uh, this presentation. I'm, I'm sorry that be because of uh, the new technology, I, that took some from me getting used to, but I hope, I hope it worked out okay. Yeah. Now let's see, maybe if somebody in the audience uh, has a, a question or a comment, or maybe even somebody from home, maybe there's a way to entertain them. We'll see. And they can send me a message. Well, thank you. So if uh, you, maybe what we could do is just uh, break and wait until we catch up with Franklin next week. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, Dan. Bye. Next Sunday. Thank you very much for coming. Appreciate it. Thank you.